to be able to go ahead and you know and get you know and, and get through his presentation and also have an opportunity to be able to go ahead and to address questions that uh, that people might have. I just wanted to briefly welcome uh, Ray Winslow and say about two sentences as to why um, we invited him to join us. I don't think anybody is unaware of um, the importance, the increasing importance of, uh, of data science. And what Ray has really done is he's one of the architects of yeah. computational medicine because he's taken um, artificial intelligence strategies and beyond dealing with uh, interrogation and interpretation of data, he's been able to go ahead and to develop approaches for really relating it to, to healthcare in terms of patient data and working with groups to be able to develop animal models that are going to go ahead and be informative. So um, this is an area I know very, very little about. I realize that I need to learn a lot more about. So that was actually my reason for going ahead and uh, inviting Ray. Um, Ray has developed um, a, some really effective working relationships with folks at, uh, at Maine Health. And uh, we're working on developing relationships with um, CTR investigators as well. So um, I'm turning it over to um, my colleagues to introduce Ray. Hello, uh, my name is Andrew Fritz. I am a faculty scientist in the Stein Lab. Um, and I'll let uh, Dr. Modal introduce herself. Hi, and I'm... Um... Katie Modell, I'm a faculty scientist too at the Maine Health Institute for Research. Okay, so um, Dr. Winslow is the Director of the Life Sciences and Medical Research at the Rue Institute at Northeastern University. Uh, he is a, also a professor of bioengineering, computer science, and clinical and rehabilitation scientist in the College of Engineering at uh, Curry College of Computer Sciences and Bove College of Health Sciences Northeastern University. Before joining the RU, uh, he was at the Raj and Neera Singh Professor of Biomedical Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and was the founding director of the Institute for Computational Medicine at the John at the Hopkins uh, Hopkins and around the world. He has contributed to the emergence of the discipline of computational medicine. This discipline uh, develops dri data-driven models of disease, constrains these models using data from individual patients, harnesses these patient-specific uh, models to deliver improved healthcare tailored to the needs of the individual. Dr. Winslow's research interests are in predictive analytics, using statistical and dynamic dynamical systems modeling methods to pr predict the temporal evolution of patient state and to predict the impending occurrence of significant changes in the patient state uh, before they occur. He is interested in applications of predictive anal analytics in both the settings of physical, bi behavioral, and mental health care. He is also interested in developing me mechanistic models of disease and harnessing these models for in silico discovery of novel therapeutics. And with that, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Winslow for joining us today. I appreciate the introduction. Thank you very much. Glad to speak with you. I'm going to hit share screen and try and get this going. And hopefully you see my slides. And hopefully it's now full screen. Is everybody seeing that? Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about collaborative opportunities with the with the Rue Institute. Uh, and I'm going to jump immediately to the second slide that is an overview of the room mission. It's a really nice slide. This is a view off of the deck of our building. We're in the Wex building on 4th Street in Portland and have this beautiful harbor view. Um, the Rue Institute was created through a donation <laughs> by Dave and Barbara Rue. Uh, they are Mainers. Uh, he was born in Lewiston, Maine, and they care about Maine. Dave um, has, there's a particular wonderful description of why he did the Rue 
that we were all reminded of two weeks ago when we watched his uh, the speech that he made at the Portland Gateway three years ago when the rule was officially announced. And that was our third anniversary two weeks ago. And the marvelous thing that he says is, in essence, that there are smart people everywhere. Smart people are distributed all around the country, but opportunity is not distributed equally around the country. Uh, and there's no reason that opportunity should reside in Austin or Seattle or San Francisco or New York City. Um, it can also reside here in Maine. And, and so that's the sentence. Our mission is to be an opportunity engine for the state of Maine, but in a particular way. And that way is by advancing quantitative engineering approaches such as AI and machine learning and modeling um, in healthcare and in other aspects of, of, of research and economic activity in Maine to create a new AI-based biotech sector of activity in Maine for the benefit of the people of Maine. I think that's a marvelous mission. I love it. You saw where we are. This is where we're going. This is a rendition of the Bean Factory building. Um, I say the Bean Factory building because, as you probably know, it's uh, Rue has acquired the, the 13 and a half acres where the Boston BN, the B and M Baked Bean Factory is currently located, yeah. and we plan on building that out as our campus for the next several centuries. It's another expression I love that Margaret Angel. I heard her first use it. We're building a campus for the next several hundred years. I like that. Um, now, this is an important slide because this shows who is in life sciences and medical research, which is the aspect of Rue's activity that I'm here to talk about. That's not all that Rue does, but it's what I direct, what I lead at the Rue. And so since we're here to talk about collaborations and opportunities, I want you to know the players and what they do, because these are people you might want to reach out to. So Saeed Amal is an assistant research professor of bioengineering at Northeastern University, and he's an institute member. He's here uh, in Portland, and his area of expertise is machine learning in healthcare. Um, uh, he's working on the Heart Project. Uh, with my colleagues, Bob Kramer and Doug Sawyer and myself. I saw that Bob was on this. I, I saw Bob pop up in this in this session. Hi, Bob. Um, Saeed's working with Bob and Doug in the Heart Project. Saeed uh, has some particular skills in a particular aspect of machine learning that is known as deep learning. Um, he's our resident expert in deep learning. Christine Larry, probably many of you know Christine or know of her. Uh, she has joined the Rue Institute. Uh, she works in the broad area of musculoskeletal genomics and aging. Her expertise is in statistical modeling and bioinformatics. I also think of her as a systems biologist because she thinks about the relationship between gene networks and phenotype. Uh, she's an associate research professor of health sciences appointed in Bouvet College. All of us have academic appointments in Northeastern University. Brianna Taylor, many of you may know her as well. Um, Brianna is an assistant research professor of psychology. She works in the area of autism spectrum disorders and their relationship to circadian rhythm disturbances, sleep disturbances. And she is spearheading our thrust in computational, behavioral, and mental health. Matteo Chinazzi is appointed not only in the RU, but also in the Northeastern University Network Sciences Institute. His area of research is computational epidemiology and biological networks in general, and he's an associate research professor of physics. Kiran Vinaja is um, an assistant research professor also in bioengineering. He's a systems biologist. He does both experiments and modeling. Um, and, 
and he's in particular a computational systems biologist, and he studies signaling networks in cancer and also in diabetes. Uh, Chin Jin is an associate research scientist, and he's a wonderful young fellow with many skills. Um, he understands dynamic systems modeling. He understands machine learning methods. Uh, he works in the area of model-guided healthcare and computational systems biology. He was a PhD student in my lab for five years. He did marvelous work on cardiac modeling and arrhythmias, went to work at Bristol-Myers Squibb for a short period of time and then decided he wanted to join us at the Rue and I was glad to have him. So that gives you an idea of who we are, who's in the group. It's really quite something, the areas of modeling and data science that we all span together. And so I think um, we're, we've built up kind of an asset and hopefully this description of what all of these folks are doing is helping you think about how you might connect to us. So um, I've been contributing to an area uh, that I call computational medicine. We wrote a paper uh, back in 2012 that was our stake in the ground of defining what computational medicine is, my colleagues and I at the Institute for Computational Medicine. And this is how we see it. We, we, we do three things. We first develop computational models of disease and models is bolded here because I want to say we use any modeling technique that's right for the problem. It's not all about AI. It's not all about machine learning. It's about other aspects of modeling, whatever is right to attack uh, the problem at hand. And modeling is important in my view because biological systems in health and disease are simply too complex for our intuition to suffice. Our mental models don't cut the mustard. I've learned that time and time again in my own work. Models are essential to understanding the complexity of biological systems. The second thing we do is we personalize the model using data that can be measured from a patient. We particularize the model to that patient. And then the third thing we do is apply the model to look to deliver better care. And so I now want to give some examples of that, but I want to just take a couple of slides and talk about broad modeling approaches and machine learning is one of them. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is a way of building models that can relate things that we measure to things that we want to predict or to categories that we want to sort data into. And the thing about machine learning is that there are ways of learning these mapping functions these functions F that take the data we measured shown here by X and produce from it an outcome. They predict an outcome or they predict a phenotype. Maybe the measurements are uh, uh, RNA expression patterns in mice. And maybe the outcome phenotype is obesity or body mass index. And we want to learn a function that maps what we measure to that outcome. And we want to do it automatically from the data. And so the way machine learning works is that people explore the use of different functions. They pose functions of different forms that may be um, constrained by some set of parameters that have to be learned from the data and develop theories about why it is that a particular function of a particular form is good for a particular learning application. What are the strengths and weaknesses of the form that we choose for F? And the strengths always have to do with what can be proven theoretically about the power of that learning rule and that learning method. So what are the advantages of machine learning? Learning this function that maps the things we measure to the outcomes that we want to predict uh, or sort data into, um, learning that function does not rely on deep, hard-won experimental knowledge of mechanism. This function F is just building relationships. They aren't necessarily 
directly based on mechanistic understanding of what these relationships are all about. So it's a plus in the sense that getting at biological measurement uh, me uh, mechanism through experiments is a hard and slow thing in many cases. Um, learning the function f from data, once one has data, is relatively fast, and computing the function, uh, computing the mapping between things we measure to outcomes is really fast. That's easy, easy to do. What, the, what are the disadvantages? Well, one of the disadvantages was one of the strengths. There's no explicit representation of mechanism in these kinds of models, which doesn't mean that we, can, that we can't learn about mechanism. We can. And the way that we typically learn about mechanism with machine learning is by sorting the measurements we make in rank order to understand what is the most what's the top feature for predicting an outcome? What's the second most important feature for predicting an outcome and third and fourth and so on. That can give us insight into what the players are. And there's some mechanism there. And it can, it can, it can give us insight into how sensitively these features control the outcome. And we can learn a lot from this kind of information. Um, and so that's the good news, but the, 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 the best news is that this is kind of an indirect way of inferring mechanism. And then the other minus is that performance in this mapping task is influenced very strongly by the quality and the quantity of, of data that we have to learn from, from and our ability to unambiguously and accurately label, label the data. So we must get it right when we say that this data is an example of class A and that data is an example of class B. Sometimes that's hard to do. And that can be, you're probably, you may, might be surprised by my saying that it's, it's, it's the case. It's true. Sometimes it's tricky. The, the process of labeling data is tricky and it's establishing ground truth. We must be able to do that. Okay. I talked for too long on that. The other kind of modeling we do is, is very mechanistically based. What I'm showing you here is uh, a wiring diagram of a molecular network that's involved in signal transduction. And so different molecules interact with other molecules, maybe more than one interaction. And understanding this network in a mechanistic level means being able to go in and, and to do experiments so that we understand how RAS and RAF interact with one another. And we can make measurements that inform us about that. So we can model, sometimes this is called physics-based modeling because we use fundamental physical, physical chemical principles to formulate the models. Now, what are the models? Um, in this network, there are a bunch of molecules that per participate in the network. They each have a concentration. A model of this network refers to representing uh, the molecular concentration of every player in this network. And we ask the question, how, does the, how do those concentrations vary in time? A signal comes in and binds to a uh, signaling molecule, binds to a receptor. The dynamics of the network, are those dynamics are reflected in time-changing concentrations of different molecular constituents taking part in this network. And so the fundamental kinds of equations that describe these interactions are differential equations. And, and these differential equations say the molecules in this network have time varying concentrations that are functions of the current value of concentration for each molecule. So this function F describes how these concentrations evolve over time. If we know this F, yet another function that we've got to learn, but here we do it from fundamental principles, we can numerically integrate these equations and simulate the behavior of these networks. So I've spent a lot of time in my career doing this kind of very detailed, um, mechanistically based simulation of cardiac myocyte function in my case. And so when I said Kieran Vinaja does computational systems biology, this is the kind of thing he does. He also does machine learning as well, but this is an example of, of what he does. So the pluses, very explicit description of biological mechanism, 
um, the minuses, understanding how to formulate this function f. It's really hard. It takes time. It takes lots of experimental data that's hard to get. And doing this numerical integration, actually solving the models can be very difficult too. But what we get from that is we've got tons of mechanism in these models. And that gives us real insight into how biology works. So these are two streams of modeling that are represented at the Rue. And of course, there's an interplay between these two streams. It's very interesting. So now we get into some applications and I'll speed things up here. Here's, here's the project that we're working on with Bob Kramer and Doug Sawyer. HEART stands for Healthcare Enabled by AI in Real Time. The idea is that um, in the cardiothoracic ICU at Maine Health, we will be capturing data from patients in real time. These will be high-frequency waveforms like ECGs and blood pressures. They will be minute-by-minute -minute vital signs data like um, heart rate, blood pressure averaged over minute interval, um, or maybe average systolic, average diastolic blood pressures, maybe averaged SpO2 over uh, the preceding interval of time. And we'll be capturing EHR data that is things like lab results, medications given to patients, um, any other measurements done in patients that that are the kinds of data that are captured in the electronic health record. We'll be taking all of that kind of information, combining it with data available at the time of admission on each patient to the ICU, and we're going to make predictions over time as these patients are recovering in the ICU. And what we're trying to do is identify those patients who are going to get into trouble. Patients who uh, perhaps will develop an infection or need to go on a ventilator or um, what, whatever, or maybe develop cardiac arrhythmias. We want to identify these adverse events and reliably not, not identify them when they're happening. We want to predict ahead of time in a reliable yeah. way those patients that are headed towards an adverse event and hopefully a specific yep. kind of adverse event. And the reason for doing that is so we can then guide caregivers to intervene and help the patients to prevent that negative event from even happening in the first place. And so the wonderful thing about this project is that it's real, it's happening. We're building an infrastructure to capture these data. It will test this clinically will provide feedback to physicians, um, to Bob and his colleagues in the CTICU. It's an incredible and very rich project that's building up a lot of follow-on studies. And it gives you an example of how we're using machine learning in healthcare. I'm skipping the next two slides because they're details. Um, so here's another kind of of modeling project relating to disease that we've done, it's the mechanistic modeling. And so for much of my career, I've devoted my time and energy to building incredibly deep models of how cardiac myocytes function. And our goal has been to build in more and more mechanism all the time. I personally think, and I'm of course biased, that our models have more mechanism incorporated into them than any other kind of model of the cardiac myocyte because we describe the function of voltage-gated ion channels in the cell membrane, membrane ion transporters, uh, intracellular processes that, that um, cycle and release calcium, the process of calcium release, the process of calcium binding to myofilaments to generate force, calcium regulation of mitochondrial function um, that produces ATP to drive energy requiring transport processes in the cell, models of signal transduction networks. They're not explicitly represented on here, but they're, they're in these models. And so the models are incredibly integrative characterized by thousands of coupled nonlinear ordinary differential equations per cell. 
And the problem that we wanted to take on was we are armed with these incredibly mechanistically detailed models. We looked at um, a genetic disorder known as long QT syndrome one. It's a particular class of genetic mutations of a particular ion channel, voltage-gated ion channel in the cell membrane. And there are many different kinds of mutations that can occur, but the end result of these mutations is that QT interval is prolonged in these patients. QT interval is a measurable surrogate for action potential duration. Action potential duration is prolonged in these patients. And the likelihood of the generation of cellular arrhythmias that are called delayed after depolarizations and early after depolarizations in this particular case um, occur is very much increased in these patients. These are known as triggered arrhythmias and they trigger arrhythmias in the heart as a whole. We wanted to be able to use information on the nature of these mutations and their effects in these cell models to make predictions about the lethality, the clinical seriousness, the clinical risk associated with a large number of different um, uh, genetic mutations involved in long QT syndrome. And the bottom line is that here it shows um, the result, one, one aspect of the results of this work. These are different mutations. This is the 30-year cardiac event rate measured clinically in patients. And these are the estimates of our probability of arrhythmia at the cell level generated from our model. This happens to be a model that in a clever way combines the mechanistic modeling that I've described and the machine learning approach that I've described. I won't go into the details, but what we were able to do is to estimate the relative risk of each of these mutations from knowing some fundamental um, information about how these mutations affect ion channel function. In other words, we were able to do risk stratification um, using the models and then gain insights into what aspects of these mutations were really driving risk of arrhythmia in the patients and in, in the cells and cell models themselves? And, and so that's an example of kind of using mechanistic modeling and fundamental machine learning to get at the basics of, of disease. So now opportunities, what do I see the opportunities for all of us as being? So um, so like the collaboration that, that Joe and I are, are building on understanding the relationship between uh, the genotype of a mouse and obesity in that mouse, we want to use machine learning methods to understand what the important genetic players are in shaping that relationship and how they control variability of that relationship. So of course, one way, one opportunity for the NNE, CTR and Rue is just for us to join up in these kinds of scientific collaborations that we do as scientists. And I say the, 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 the nice connections are ones where data meets the need for modeling. And I personally feel there's a need for modeling everywhere. So no matter what you're doing in biology, there's a need to wrap models around it to understand what you're doing. And I think this all leads to exciting research and of course, papers and grant funding. And, and this, is, this is kind of standard. This is how um, scientists relate to one another, but there are abundant opportunities. And that's why I showed this slide on all of our people and talked a little bit about what they do. There are opportunities at Rue, perhaps to access different kinds of trainees to take part in your research. So Rue is a part of Northeastern University. Northeastern University is known for its co-op programs. What that means is that undergraduate students all are required to do an internship with a business or a research lab. It's not all companies, it can be research labs for six months to a year, um, and that's called the co-op program. And so their education actually takes five years because 
They have four years of coursework and in a year of these internships, these co-ops, and they work on real world problems. So this is the Northeastern thing, experiential learning. And so these students can work anywhere. And so imagine having an engineering student with a strong math, engineering, signal processing, machine learning background, and able to step into your lab for six months to a year and do a substantive project. That's pretty cool. And so this exists at the undergraduate level and at the master's level. And, and, and of course, we host PhD students and postdocs at the RU as well and have mechanisms from the Alfond Foundation for supporting those students, at least in Maine. And so we are an opportunity to access students of a particular phenotype, the phenotype being they're trained in biomedical data science and modeling in general and in biology. Another phenotype that is an, another a phenotype, another opportunity that has just come up. Um, we have worked together on the NSF regional innovation proposal. It just went in. The NNE CTR was a partner in that proposal. The proposal was called Computational Medicine in Northern New England, Innovation Driven by in Silico Design for Health and Well-Being. A bit ver verbose, uh, I think, but that's the title. It had two thrusts. One was model guided healthcare. Heart was an example of what I mean by model guided healthcare. The second thrust was model guided engineering of cells and cell assemblies for design of novel therapeutics. A particular application area in mind that, that involves both the machine learning aspects, but the mechanistic modeling aspects. One of our partners in this effort was Jackson Laboratories. Jax is building a new business line of activity. It's going to be major. So they are not only going to sell mice and produce specialized mice of particular genotype and phenotype. They are now going to produce custom engineered cells and cell assemblies organoids for various research purposes and drug discovery purposes. Our idea is that we are going to use all aspects of modeling to help guide the process of designing cells and cell assemblies to have particular properties, particular phenotypes. Every industry today is guided by modeling. There isn't a plane, a car, a bridge, a ship, a building, that isn't first built on computer and thoroughly tested. We believe the same thing needs to be done with therapies, the design of therapies. It needs to be wrapped, modeling needs to wrap around that design process in a very intimate way and guide every aspect of the experimental investigation to focus, focus, focus. And hopefully by the focusing and the guidance of models that more effective drugs can be discovered more quickly because you don't spend your time on doing things and investing compounds that aren't the right compounds. Maybe the compound you're interested in is not hitting the right target. Maybe the molecular target is really not the molecular control point in a complex molecular network. Maybe you need models to identify what that control point really is before you begin trying to discover a drug that hits what you think are control points that may not be the important control points, or maybe a control point that is in fact controllable by a drug. Um, okay, I hope that's clear. So um, we are hoping if this NSF RIE is funded, that we can support pilot projects with this NNE CTR. Um, in areas of computational medicine. And we built up an inf we proposed an infrastructure of human talent and resources that could help new projects. Our, our job is to go find new projects, help them, grow them, help them translate into real world applications and maybe even businesses, startups. 
or licensed IP. We are to be enablers of that. That's the job of, of an innovation engine and ours is in computational medicine. So that's a way that, that's an opportunity for collaboration. And I will close with this, a slide given to me by Eileen Wong Saad, who wanted me to mention the Biopilot Collaboratory. This is an effort being worked on with University of Southern Maine to give us experimental space um, through the resources of University of Southern Maine that can become incubator space for biotech companies um, who need access to um, laboratories uh, for their startups. There are faculty that can contribute to this who have experimental skills in a wide variety of areas. I didn't describe what those areas really are, um, but this is one pathway by which the Rue itself may be creating wet lab space and experimental opportunities in particular for incubator companies in the biotech world. This may be of relevance to you as well. This may be an area of opportunity to you. So that's what I have. Let's uh, happy to take questions now and get into discussion. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Dr. Winslow, for that thought-provoking uh, presentation. We do have quite a few comments in the chat, and I was wondering if um, some of them are a bit lengthy, but maybe for the longer ones, we could try to get those people to, to unmute. But first, um, Bob Wilden is asking, can machine learning be used to expose labeling that is poorly done as a way to focus improvements in the labeling process or algorithm? And Bob, if you want to expand on that at all, you're welcome to unmute as well. Sure. Just, uh, just um, 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 when you were talking about that, and you know um, how how important labeling is, and 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 in medicine, as you know, if you rely on um, labeling from the EHR, you're going to be disappointed many times. And so the, the question is, can you generate evidence of what labels um, that you think are important but are not showing up as important? Um, maybe you can turn around and say, let's see what process we have of generating that, that and make sure that we improve it. Is that you know kind of a sideline uh, function? Um, I'll do my best to answer that question. I've been thinking about it as it was posed, and I'm not entirely satisfied with my answer, but here it goes. The way that we have done labeling with clinical data is to not use, for example, ICD-9, ICD-10 codes. We don't um, rely on those codes as ground truth since they can be so heavily influenced by issues of billing and reimbursement and that kind of thing. Instead, what we have relied on um, in areas where they're available are consensus emerging or already established consensus definitions, for example, of what sepsis is or what septic shock is or what multiple organ dysfunction syndrome is. In the case of the sepsis examples I gave, um, we have relied heavily on an international consortium that meets every year to think about these definitions in a deep way and to publish their recommended definitions. So we've tended to use those. And the advantage of them is that they are conditions on variables that are in the electronic health record so that we can sweep through large number of patient records and do a kind of automated computational diagnosis using these standard definitions. Um, and so comment number one is, I suggest not relying on clinical coding systems that are fundamentally driven by um, uh, billing purposes, rather relying for ground truth to the extent available on consensus or emerging consensus definitions of, of the clinical conditions of interest. The second thing I have to say is that I talked about 
supervised learning, and there is an, a domain of unsupervised learning, which can be valuable to define the very underlying categories of data that are present in your data set in an unbiased way. Um, supervised learning means you need an expert to establish this ground truth and do labeling. Unsupervised learning means we are going to identify the categories of data that are naturally there in the data sets themselves and kind of discover it for our own on our own and then label by assigning data to some number of categories that we discover by unbiased analysis of the data sets themselves. That's another strategy for doing labeling that um, uh, at least is uh, principled and, and, and offers guidance in situations where there may not be any consensus definitions. And instead what you do is simply discover the natural categories that are in the data and its advantage is that these are automated processes too, by which you can label with ground truth. Um, I, um, I hope, I hope that's, I hope that's somewhat helpful to you. I, I'm not sure it's entirely. I, I, I think that is. I think the you know the 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 trouble of relying on the you know consensus things is that and so those can have their own built-in biases as well. Yeah, um, yeah. And but also that I mean I'm a geneticist. I work in rare rare disorders or uncommon disorders. And and we have a huge spectrum of 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 that, and so it's really hard to get the you know that sort of level of international consensus or something on yeah. the definition of anything. Yeah. Uh, and and so much of what we're seeing also is is emerging diseases that yeah. there's no consensus on. Yeah. Um, so it, it's difficult to uh, to to sort of take that path from that standpoint. And another yeah. sort of related question is. You know, if if we take all of these these together, particularly in sort of a predictive population health screening kinds of thing, where the patients are not themselves necessarily symptomatic at this point in time, but may have a risk in the future, um, we can address every single one of those individually. Um, but really, what we want to know is 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 the process of this screening for multiple disorders um, uh, it beneficial to health in the long run, and are there measures that can we can look at to pop out that are not necessarily disease specific but overall well-being and wellness measures yep all very good points thank you yep thank you um let's go to dr stein i don't know where dr stein is but gary is here by the way just <laughs> i had a question about uh if we so let's let's go to the other end of the spectrum let's look at at, at regulation and you uh, put up a slide before that showed a regulatory network. Um, and if we took it to a to biology and pathology, let's talk about cancer compromised epigenetic control. The diagram is a two dimensional um, rendition of the um, representation of components for interactions and some uh, connections uh, between them. But in the cell itself, you're looking at a three-dimensional organization, um, and that plays a tremendously uh, significant role, um, certainly genomic organization and even uh, the architectural organization of regulatory you know, hubs within the nucleus or cytoplasm of a cell. But then there's the fourth dimension, which has to be taken into consideration, and that's time. So is, are the all four dimensions um, approachable um, with modeling tools? Yes. Um, that's a wonderful question. Uh, so the models of the cardiac myocyte that we have been developing are, and I, and I took out a part of the slide that illustrated this, and I don't think I should have now. Um, they are three-dimensional, structurally detailed models that capture the fundamental importance of co-localization of molecules and receptors and, and signaling proteins. Um, and so that's that adds a, you know, a high degree of complexity to the model. But for example, in the cardiac myocyte, the L-type calcium channels that allow calcium to enter the cell are 10 nanometers away from the channels that bind calcium 
and open and release calcium, a massive amount of calcium into the cell to trigger muscle contraction. And, and however biology does it, they build them right there together in this very highly localized 3D structure. And this happens over and over again, everywhere you look in cells and, and, and certainly in the cardiac myocyte that space matters and co-localization matters. So yes, um, there are many examples of models that take into account the spatial dimension and co-localization and signaling in nano domains. That's how I like to refer to signaling in nano domains. Time is implicit in these models. Differential equations describe the evolution of system properties over time. That is their power. And 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 so and 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 that's all that that's also the demand of such models because you can imagine uh, a model of the myocyte with all these mechanisms and players with maybe 50,000 spatial compartments and we're integrating these systems over time. That's a huge calculation. And so the challenge is that these are very demanding models, but the fundamental ways in, in, in an understanding of the kinds of information we need to formulate these models is certainly there. And what's really cool, Gary, and I didn't say this at all, is that we have explored how to take those incredibly complex 4D models, you call them a 4D model, and for very particular question, learn from simulations a simple function by using machine learning methods that allows us to relate model parameters to model outputs. I probably didn't do a good job describing that, but what I'm trying to get at is a huge domain of machine learning in the future, I think, is how is learning simpler representations of these really super complex models that allow us to get in and really tackle important but focused problems. And for each problem, you might have to relearn the, the right representation, but once you do it, it's possible to do pencil and paper math on those models, they're so simple. It's really important. That's how we did the prediction of um, the risk associated with these different mutations. We learned a simple, simple, simple model of this unbelievably complex model. And we're able to do in pencil and paper math that showed us what the regulators were. I you think know, I was like in a really discussion that Cliff and I were having the other day about instrumentation. And that is if you go ahead and you take a cell or if you take a tissue, and you apply um, stretch or compression, um, it's not just the shape of the cell that changes, but then the architectural relationships between the components and yep. those models changes. Yes. Is that yes. something that can be built in as well? In principle, yes, because those architectural relationships are vitally important, in my case, to what the cardiac myocyte does. Yes. So they are there. And if there are processes that modulate them, and by the way, in heart disease, they are modulated. This co-localization is often disrupted. So there are, a disease does modulate this microarchitecture that you're speaking of. Yes, there, there, are, there are many different systems where this kind of modeling has been done that can serve as examples of how it's done. And stenosis may go ahead and change the, uh, the time, the rate factor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think next, let's go to Joe Nato. Would you mind um, asking your question? I was going to ask my question, but Gary Gary basically got to the gist of it, and okay. uh, Ray basically answered it, so I'm good. I Great. was going to frame it in a little different way, but I'm good. Thanks. Excellent. Okay, so the next question is from Tom Miller. Um, while physiology, cell signaling, genetics, et cetera, are exciting and fun to study, what many of us are finding in outcomes research is that the signal from genetic and clinical factors are dwarfed by the signal from social determinants. Is there anyone or any group at RU that works on modeling social determinants such as disparities in healthcare access in rural New England? Great question. I appreciate the question. Um, 
there are people who would like to work on it. I don't think there are people who are working on it. Um, I'm one of the people that would like to work on this. Um, the way I view this is these social factors, these life lifestyle factors, um, to study them, we have to be able to quantify them. If we are studying them and are quantifying them, they're useful as features in learning systems. They can be features upon which learning is based, just like anything else that we measure can be a feature upon which learning is based. And the advantage of doing so is that we can then test your hypothesis quantitatively. If these features are playing a major role in health, and I'm, I'm not saying they aren't, I'm just illustrating that by using machine learning and interpretable machine learning methods to rank order feature importance to making a prediction from data to phenotype or outcome, if these features that you mention are playing a vital role, they will, they must emerge as the top ranked predictors of outcomes. And so my interest is in, in doing that. I, I, no one at the Rue is doing that yet. I'm saying that there is a natural way in which machine learning would lend itself to these kinds of questions uh, about relating life experiences to outcomes. I hope that makes sense. I, th I, th I, I, I would certainly be interested in learning more about this. Okay, great. Um, next question is from Elizabeth Bonney. Are you at all by chance interested in the placenta? There's a lot of interest in drugs for pregnant and lactating women and in the development of trophoblast organoids. I have never done that kind of work, um, but I am interested in great scientific problems where there are great scientific data sets to learn from. Um, I don't mean that facetiously. I mean, it, it, I, I, I look for the low-hanging fruit, and the low-hanging fruit in my books, uh, in my book, is problems that are important to solve and problems where there are sufficient data sets in hand mm -hmm. to begin understanding how to bring modeling to bear on those problems. Right, right, I, I right. don't. I don't know anything about this problem area per se, but I'm. I am happy to explore it, as are others. I'm sure at the Rue, particularly. Um, I would say Kieran Vinaja, and Chin Jin, and myself. Okay. Another question in the chat um, is from Christopher Franklin, and we might need him to unmute to clarify. Is there any consensus on? threshold, for example, number of subjects, patients necessary before these techniques can give meaningful results? There is no theory on that, unfortunately. Um, there are rules of thumb that mm -hmm. people who do lots of applied machine learning often say. And the rule of thumb is that um, if you have N features, you should at least have 10 times n examples mm. in your data set from which to learn. Um, unfortunately, there is no equivalent of statistical power analysis yet in machine learning problems that says, here's the amount of data that you need to achieve a certain specificity and sensitivity in, this, in solving this classification or prediction problem with a machine learner. Um, and so my philosophy is never back away from trying. In fact, it's, you know, one of the powers of machine learning is that there are so many powerful tool sets out there that you, you got to know what you're doing with the tool sets, but it's almost cookbook. The work can go very, very quickly. So why lock yourself up and hesitate about doing things? I say, try it, see what happens, because time to solution 
can be remarkably fast given the power and the capability of the tools that are so widely available now. That's why that's part of the reason machine learning is having the impact that it's having is that the tool sets are remarkable and they're getting better all the time. So try it. Um, uh, it it's not a status. Well, yeah, that's the answer, frankly. That's the answer. Uh, don't talk yourself out of out of attempting the machine learning task. Thank we have that. worked on problems with 50 examples, 50 examples, and gotten solid results out of them. So it's it's hard to know a priori if you have enough data or not. Thanks. That's a great answer. Could you say something a little bit about data quality? Because you mentioned that that was a key determinant of success, yes. right? Yeah. Okay. So an extreme example is the following. There is a MIT technology review article, um, which I won't be able to exactly reconstruct the title, but it came out during the COVID ep epidemic. And it was something like, why isn't AI helping us in COVID? And it was a review of every published machine learning system that had anything to do with predicting or treating aspects of COVID. And it pointed out the following unbelievable circumstance, that many public COVID data sets that had been assembled had been collected together from different, very diverse data sets themselves. And there was an extensive amount of mislabeling going on in these, in this aggregated collection of data. And the particular example I remember is that there were chest x-rays of children with who knows what symptom, not, not, not necessarily COVID, that were included into these presumably adult data sets as, as images of patients, adult patients with COVID, <laughs> when in fact they were imaging data sets from children with any range of diseases. Now that's stuck in my mind because it is such a gross example of mislabeling. That's not a typical example of, mis of, of mislabeling or low data quality. More common examples are, and you see this every time you get a data set, that a study is designed to collect n different variables from patients. But in the real world, not everything is always collected from every patient. And so the first thing I have students do in our class team projects is to look at missingness in data. What variables were actually measured in which patients? and which are missing are, are is 90% uh, is a variable missing in 90% of the patients or is it is it available in 60% 70 80% of the patients and if so do if it's highly highly missing maybe it needs to be disregarded as a feature in the study because it's just not there if it's 60% missing maybe we should explore there's a whole field called data imputation, which learns the relationships between all of the other variables that may be present and the missing variables to try and fill them in. And so missingness of data and how to deal with it is a huge aspect of data quality. Then there's noise in data, um, depending on the measurement system, and there's bias in sensors. Um, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but I know that the, 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 the little clip that goes on your finger to measure SpO2, I think consistently um, overestimates SpO2 in, in uh, patients of color. Now, you, many, some of you may know this and may get that fact more accurate than I can present it, but it's an example of an inherent bias in the sensors themselves. These all factor into data qual quality. I think the biggies from my point of view are 
do we have ground truth or not? The quality of the labeling. Number two, missingness of data and how to how we can deal with it, because that really affects the overall N in your the number of subjects you have data from to really work with, and noisiness and bias in data. Great. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. We're right around one o'clock. Would you mind answering a few more questions? Sure, or? I'm happy to do that. Let me see if I've got. Um, Dr. Any... Bonnie or Elizabeth Bonnie, you had your hand raised. Would you like to follow up on your comment earlier? Well, I, it was sort of, it wasn't really related. Thank you very much. The, the question is, if you've got students who are, are trained and want to do a project, that's great, but there might be the other way around where we have faculty or, or trainees that want to learn about machine learning and get sort of the ground level um, skill set. And that would be a great thing to do for a six or eight, you know, or 12 weeks um, that we could try to release them from their clinical duties or whatever here. And I'm just wondering if that's a possibility if someone wanted to do that. Absolutely. We are very interested in that learning need. Um, I, I would say um, over the last three years, Rue has invested more energy in that kind of learning need, if you will, than than into more formal programs like residential PhD programs and master's programs and all of that. We have been more focused on learners who have a job and are doing other things and have limited time to learn and creating learning opportunities for them. The person you should speak to about this is Eileen Wong Saad, H-U-A-N-G dash S-A-A-D. She does this, she directs um, uh, academic uh, and learning activities in life sciences. Uh, and she would love to talk to you about this. Uh, this is very much up Rue's alley is the answer, yes. So by all means, speak with Eileen, and I'm happy to take part as needed if I can help. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, there's a comment in the chat from Susan Santangelo um, regarding um, uh, Kristen Costa's um, course that she's developing, Real World Data to Real World Evidence. Um, so if you're interested in that, please check out her comment in the chat. Um, we also have a comment from Elizabeth Jacobs that there's uh, social determinants of health are being incorporated to the electronic medical records, um, and there are some great ways to quantify them, and um, even when they're not directly measured. So, um, for example, census tract based social disadvantage measurements, um, and, and Dr. Jacobs, if you have other comments, feel free to unmute and um, and follow up on that. We also have um, a comment from Dr. Rosado. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate your interest in sepsis. The expansion of drug resistant pathogens makes the control of sepsis even more challenging. Can we predict by AI secondary infections before they lead to mortality? Uh, we don't have even diagnostics to avoid uh, to predict uh, the phase transition. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things to say about sepsis. I'd love um, to talk directly about that. I'll give you a, I, I skipped over the slides because of time. Uh, what is so interesting to me is that, uh, so we, we studied in depth the following prediction problem. Given a patient has sepsis, can we reliably predict those patients who are going to transition to septic shock and can and with how much lead time can we do that? Mm -hmm. So the answer is the lead time has a distribution. The median of the distribution is about eight hours. The way we do these predictions is we learn a risk score from a set of about 10 clinical variables. We continuously update that risk score over time and we learn a threshold such that when the risk crosses that threshold, we declare that patient is going into sepsis. There's all kinds of stuff we learned from doing this. It was 
remarkable. One of the most remarkable things is how quickly the risk score changes from something very low to something very high. It's over a span of about 15 minutes. A patient goes from one world of risk to an entirely different world of risk well before they're ever in septic shock. And then the risk stays high. That was the most interesting thing to me. Second most interesting thing was before this threshold crossing event, there's no difference in anyone's risk score. After the threshold crossing, crossing event, they stratify into different risk categories. In the highest risk category, the mortality rate is about 50%. And the interesting thing is we can predict that, cat, that a patient is in that category correctly about 90% of the time with that substantial on average eight hour advanced early warning. Um, and so I all, and the third thing, this is my interpretation. I believe this threshold event defines septic shock. I don't think it's a pre-signature. I think it's septic shock and that it's, it's an example of what I think of as a computationally discovered set of diagnostic criteria that emerge from the risk score, the properties of the risk score itself. I don't think the shock event comes eight hours later on average. I think those patients are then in shock, period. And and uh, and so if the, I don't know if that's a useful observation or not, but um, I think that it's remarkable how the body's feedback control system just seems to collapse so quickly and so suddenly. And by the way, every condition we've looked at in critical care units has this same property. The risk score has a signature of changing very abruptly over a period, very short period of time. So we've looked at it in multiple organ dysfunction syndrome and need for mechanical ventilation, the same thing over and over again the risk that is predicting a particular outcome, it just changes so fast all at once. I think that speaks to the need for computational intelligent monitoring because these transition events are just such rapid events. Okay, so thank you so much for that wonderful seminar and for the and thank you to the participants for the engaging discussion. I think there's a few more questions in the chat and comments, um, and hopefully you'll be able to get those or I would encourage others to feel free to email you. I'm sure you'd be willing to talk further about these things. Indeed. So thank you again for joining us. Wonderful questions. Email me. I do have to run to another meeting, but thanks for coming and